Thank you, everyone, for joining today. So uh, welcome to the Smart Policing Initiative webinar on using randomized control trials in criminal justice. As uh, Zoe mentioned, um, my name is Vivian Elliott. I'm a project manager from CNA for the Training and Technical Assistance uh, Smart Policing Initiative. Uh, we're very happy that you've joined us. So today's webinar is a series of webinars sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and coordinated by CNA. Uh, we have conducted over 30 webinars, uh, which are available on our SPI website, www.smartpolicinginitiative.com. And we have some other webinars uh, currently in the works for later this year on addressing uh, mental health issues and law enforcement and collaboration, uh, and certainly welcome suggestions from the SPI community on other topics you would like to learn more on. Today's webinar, though, um, focuses on using randomized controlled trials in criminal justice um, and is tied to an important issue and core component of the Smart Policing Initiative, which is the use of data in research-driven analysis and working with police researchers to evaluate the impacts and effectiveness of various policing strategies. SPI purposefully re uh, requires systematic research on implementation and outcome of innovations. Therefore, the members of the SPI community in our SPI sites uh, must improve the quality of their knowledge base about effective police practices and their confidence in research findings through um, thoroughly documenting implementation activities, improving performance measurement, and uh, most importantly, measuring the outcomes of com using comparative evaluation strategies and designs. So for all of our SPI sites, we strive for a high level of evaluation research, uh, which you will learn more about today um, on our webinar, in addition to specifics around uh, uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, the gold standard in, of scientific research. Today's webinar will also touch on practical considerations and uses of randomized controlled trials uh, in police research. Thus, we are very grateful to have three excellent speakers today uh, for this webinar. Uh, the first is Dr. Michael White, a professor and director of the PhD program at the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University. Dr. White is also a senior subject matter expert um, supporting um, multiple SPI sites in research and evaluation, as well as being the research partner for our Glendale and Phoenix, Arizona SPI sites. Next, we have Dr. Gypsy Escobar. Uh, she is the Director of Research at Measures for Justice and is also a subject matter expert uh, supporting the Smart Policing Initiative and has provided training and technical assistance uh, to our SPI sites on research evaluation. And then finally, we're happy to have uh, Dr. Brenda Buren, Director of at the Tempe Police Department in Arizona, and she will be providing uh, her practitioner perspective on rigorous research designs. Uh, we also want to thank the Bureau of Justice Assistance for its longstanding support of the Smart Policing Initiative, um, and um, all of our uh, speakers and the staff from CNA for their effort in putting this webinar together. Uh, we are very confident that you will learn something interesting today around uh, rigorous experimental research, uh, and thank you for your interest and participation in this webinar. So if you'll allow me, uh, I'm going to cover a few other administrative and logistical comments, uh, and then I'd like to hand it over to Kate McNamee from BJA uh, to provide a few introductory comments, and then over to Dr. White for our presentation. So first, uh, so you all are aware, this webinar is being recorded for the benefit of others who may view it later on our SPI website. We will have the webinar posted online uh, with the presentation um, within the coming week. In addition, throughout the presentation, uh, you will notice that there will be opportunities for questions or comments. Uh, we call these our uh, stop and think or stop and talk uh, moments. So please feel free to um, take advantage of these opportunities um, and ask any questions. Um, you will also see that there is a chat capability in the WebEx software today. Uh, you can use this um, to also input questions, uh, which we will monitor and facilitate uh, throughout the presentation. 
Uh, immediately following the webinar, you will receive a request to evaluate it. Uh, we ask that you take a few moments to complete the evaluation and give us your honest thoughts and recommendations. So uh, we thank you all for your uh, participation and interest today. And let me turn it over to Kate from BJA for her comments. Kate? for joining us today. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of discussion about the importance of evidence-based practices. And uh, that's really evidenced by everyone who showed up to this webinar today. It's so heavily, atten it's so heavily attended because uh, evidence-based practices are a real buzzword or a buzz phrase right now. Um, but really, at the heart of evidence-based practice is, of course, scientific inquiry and evaluation. And BJA created its smart suite of programming, which includes smart policing, smart prosecution, smart process, smart supervision, um, and other programs um, so that we could actively infuse strong empirical evaluations throughout uh, the interventions that we are supporting. And we did this because this is the only way uh, that BJA um, can say to the field with confidence that this intervention works, this reduces violence, this saves you resources, this will make a difference in your community, and your agency should consider doing it, and more importantly, putting your scarce resources behind it. And as Vivian mentioned, the gold standard of evaluation and, and the focus of today's discussion is, of course, the randomly controlled trial and experimental design. Um, but I, you know, we all know, those of us who work in criminal justice, that such methods have not always been an easy sell for criminal justice agencies. There are real-world competing political and public service demands in play um, that may interfere uh, with, with, with the receptiveness of an agency to, um, to, to these methods, to randomly controlled trials and experimental design. However, We've made remarkable progress um, in smart policing and other areas of policing research um, in successfully supporting such designs. And the, certainly the strength of SPI findings has increased as a result. And I am very confident that the policing world has truly opened itself up um, to this approach uh, to evaluation in a way that they really had not before. And it's just very encouraging. So I'm very grateful to our presenters for joining us today. Um, you know, you'll definitely learn a lot from Drs. White, Escobar, and Buren. And uh, I look forward to hearing from them as well. So I'll turn it back to Vivian so we can get started. Wonderful. Thank you, Kate. Uh, let's uh, turn it over to Dr. White to kick us off. Okay, thanks, Kate, and thanks, Vivian. Um, this is uh, Mike White from ASU. Just uh, a, a brief overview of what we're going to what we're going to cover in this webinar. Uh, I'm going to start off just talking for a minute or two about uh, the importance of randomized controlled trials, and, and then I'll turn it over to to Gypsy. Uh, Gypsy is really going to give a kind of a thirty thousand foot level discussion of the of the issues that we should think about with randomized controlled trials, the key features some of the advantages and disadvantages, and then in, in particular the things that we should think about when, uh, when implementing a randomized control trial. Uh, and not just with regard to methodology, but also with regard to ethical and practical issues that we have to face. Uh, after that, Gypsy will turn it over to me. And I, I'll, I'll provide some specific examples of randomized uh, controlled trials in policing. And my intent will be to, to demonstrate uh, really what happens when the rubber hits the road, that is, when some of those principles that Gypsy will, will discuss, what happens when they're implemented in the real world in policing. Uh, and after a brief recap, then I'll turn it over to, to Brenda, and she can offer uh, her thoughts on the, uh, the, you know, from the practitioner's perspective regarding the, the value of uh, rigorous research designs. And, and as Vivian said, we'll have a, a couple of different times where people can ask questions throughout the um, throughout the, the webinar. But first, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about why we're here, 
and why we're having this discussion about randomized controlled trials. And if you think if you think about the uh, the, the literature on policing, you know, research in policing really started in the in the 1960s. And if you think about from the 1960s really through the mid 90s, there were just a handful of randomized controlled trials in policing and in criminal justice in general. And, and most of us can can recite those, and and we can do that on one hand. The Kansas City Preventive Patrol Study, for example. But what, what's really happened in, in the last 15 or 20 years is that in, in 21st century policing, uh, dare I say that, that randomized controlled trials, rigorous research designs have become almost routine. And this goes to the point that, uh, that Kate was raising. And I think this is, a, this is a critically important development. And what it says is that uh, policing as, as a profession has really come a long way in terms of emphasizing the evidence base. And by evidence-based, what I mean is emphasizing the strategies, the tactics that are known to work, that is, research has demonstrated that they're effective. And that's really the key. That's where the rigorous research comes in, because the rigorous research design allow us to draw that, that causal uh, conclusion about effectiveness. And it allows us to, to fill the toolbox with the tools that work, and then departments that are interested in a in a, attacking a particular problem can go to that tool back, uh, toolbox, find the strategies that are effective, and implement them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we're at a point now where if I'm in a, in a chief's office and I'm, I'm pitching a randomized controlled trial, the chief, that police department, really views that opportunity to carry out a randomized controlled trial as an opportunity to, to fill that toolbox and to make a contribution. Uh, one one brief example before I, I turn it over to Gypsy. If if you follow the the research on body worn cameras at all, you, you probably noticed two or three weeks ago a couple of studies came out from Cambridge that were uh, very pro provocative because they suggested that uh, that perhaps body worn cameras are associated with increases in use of force and increases in assault on officers. And um, just as an illustration of how far we've come, even before I saw those those studies as an academic, I got an email from Brenda, and Brenda was sending me the link to those studies. I do a lot of work with the Spokane Police Department, and I was told that at a roll call uh, in Spokane, the, the patrol officers had a copy of the paper from the, Euro the European Journal of Criminology, and they were passing it around at roll call and discussing the findings. So I think that's, just, that's a real good example demonstrating, uh, demonstrating how far that we have come with regard to uh, the profession understanding the importance of randomized controlled trials. So I think at that point I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Gypsy now. Gypsy, before you uh, before you get into the high level discussion, maybe you just want to take a moment to explain uh, a, a bit about Measures for Justice where you work because uh, uh, perhaps not everyone is familiar with it. Uh, sure. Thank you, Mike and uh, Kate and Vivian. Um, just the, the the gist of what Measures for Justice do. Um, we are creating the basis for a system that measures performance in criminal justice uh, from beginning to end, from arrest to post conviction, um, at the local level. So uh, we're looking at uh, measurement basically at the county level, um, which complicates things a little bit for, for law enforcement. Um, but the idea is that we will be uh, 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 de uh, developing a web tool, uh, which we hope to launch uh, early this fall, um, that will allow users, anybody, you know, lay public, all the way to you know academics um, to to see how their uh, counties are doing on on, on certain measures. Um, we're going to launch with data from six states, and we're still in the in the data collection process from um, counties in in multiple other states. So that's basically what uh, criminal justice um, is about. Thanks for the opportunity to mention it. Um, so getting into the basics, <coughs> excuse me. Like my, as Mike said. Uh, I'm basically going to give you like kind of a 30,000 uh, feed view uh, of the basics of experimental design and particularly of randomized controlled trials. So let's start with the basics. What is an experiment? Well, you know, an experiment is a natural way of learning. Um, that's how human beings actually learn. I have a two-year-old and on a minute-by-minute -minute basis I can see him conducting little experiments that help him learn, right? Most of them 
involve disgusting experiments with food and other gross, gross uh, stuff. But what they tell you is, you know, don't, don't stop them. Allow them to play with food. Allow them to play with disgusting stuff and get, in, and get their hands dirty because that's how they learn, right? We learn by experimenting. So the basic idea of uh, an experiment is the same uh, no matter what you're investigating. So you could be investigating the effect of a new pharmaceutical drug on heart disease, or you could be experimenting the effect of a new patrolling strategy on crime on a given area, and the principles are still the same, right? The idea is that the researcher collects evidence Hello everyone, this is uh, Zoe from SPI. Is, uh, is anyone hearing me speaking right now? Yes, I am. Hi Zoe, this is Mike. I can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, can if, hear you. if you're still on the line, we're not hearing your audio anymore. All right, um, I'm going to try to coordinate. Oh, Gipsy, are you back on? All right, Lola, um, while I try to uh, chat to Gypsy and see whether we can get her audio uh, fixed, um, I don't know, Mike, maybe you just want to wrap up this slide and hopefully we'll have it back on in a minute or two. Sure, I can, I can try to take over. I don't have control of the slides right now, so I don't have the ability to flip them. That's a good point. Um, I'll give them to you real quick. Okay, so I'll, I'll pick this up, and uh, I don't know the stories of uh, Gypsy's two-year-old and the experiments with food, but uh, I'll come back to, I guess, some of the, the high-level principles. Um, you know, as you can Hello? see, can you, and as Gypsy can you guys was hear saying, me now? I hear you, Gypsy. Do you want to jump back in and, and take over? Sh sure. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Hello? Uh, Mike, can you uh, give me the bowl back, please? Oh, thank you. Um, okay, sorry Gypsy, about that. I just sure gave you the slides back, so you should be in control. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. I don't know what happened. Um, I'm not sure where you lost me, but I was basically saying that uh, there are many different types of experimental design designs, uh, but today we're going to focus on uh, one of the experimental designs that is most commonly used to evaluate criminal justice uh, interventions which is the randomized uh, controlled trials. So there are four basic principles uh, to randomized controlled trials. Um, the first one, as uh, the name of the design uh, uh, suggests, is random assignment, right? So you're, uh, the, the idea is that participants uh, or cases will be assigned to control and experimental uh, groups. The idea of random assignment is uh, that you will make the groups, the groups equivalent so that the true effect of the intervention can be estimated. The next principle is implementation of treatment or intervention to the experimental group. And the third principle is that the control group receives no treatment or a treatment uh, that is uh, the standard treatment. Um, in fact, some of the uh, RCTs in, in policing have used this kind of like three group uh, uh, design where they have one control group with no treatment, one control group with a standard practice or standard treatment, and uh, an experimental group with uh, the, the, the new uh, intervention so that they can compare both with having no intervention whatsoever and compared to uh, an intervention that has been used up to the moment. 
And the last principle deals with the ability to compare outcomes on a dependent variable for the experimental and control groups pre and post uh, implementation. Um, it's important to also look at the uh, 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 the baseline of a given uh, outcome before we start implementation to see um, the true effect. So the idea of random assignment, as I said before, is to be able to uh, estimate causality. However, uh, inferring cause and effect is a complex and uh, difficult process. Um, Larry Sherman and colleagues uh, put together this Maryland Scientific Method Scale, uh, also known as the SMS, which basically uh, uh, basically um, kind of like scores the the methodological quality of studies from low to high, depending on their uh, research design. So at level one, uh, you have studies that basically look only at a correlation between the intervention and an outcome, say crime, at one point in time. So this is usually a bivariate analysis, uh, where you are looking only at uh, uh, the intervention and the potential outcome. So an example of this is, for instance, if areas with where CCTV uh, was implemented were correlated with having lower crime rates um, than areas that did not have CCTV. The problem with this approach is that you will know if the crime rates were lower in those areas before CCTV was implemented because you're not controlling for previous levels of crime. So you can't really say with any level of certainty that CCTV, in fact, led to the reduction in crime. The next level um, considered by the SMS it measures the, uh, the outcome before and after the intervention, but there are no comparable control conditions. So for instance, um, the following the CCTV example, you could say that crime decreased after CCTV was installed in a given area. But the problem with this approach is that you can tell whether the change in crime within those areas was actually caused by CCTV or some other unrelated factor. You need to compare to other areas where CCTV was not installed. Level three uh, assumes the, uh, measures the outcome before and after in intervention in two conditions, one that received the intervention and one that did not. The, so in the CCTV example, a design that follows this level of quality, uh, you, know, you could say that crime decreased after CCTV was installed in an experimental area, but there was no decrease in a comparable area. And this approach is definitely an improvement over levels one and two. However, it's still problematic because you still don't know if CCTV was the real cause of the crime de decrease or if, it was, or if the reduction in crime was random or uh, due to some other unrelated factors that we're not controlling for. So you need to control for other potential explanations to be able to tell whether CCTV was indeed um, the cause for the crime reduction. In level four, you measure the outcome before and after intervention in treatment and control uh, uh, groups, uh, and you also control for other potential uh, uh, explanations. So this is what we call a multivariate analysis. So in, in addition to looking at the independent, independent variable, which will be the intervention, and its effect on the dependent variable, which will be the outcome, we're also looking at controlling for the potential effect of other things. So going back to our CCTV example, you can say that crime in premises uh, that had CCTV surveillance decreased compared to crime in control premises after controlling for the features of premises that influence the potential for crime. So this approach solves the problems in levels one through three, right? First, it compares crimes before and after CCTV. It uses a comparison area, and it controls for other factors such as proximity to escape routes for offenders like subway station or expressway. This is a, a, a preferable to the other three levels. However, it still doesn't have kind of like the golden rule of random assignment, which, which will be expressed in level five, which is basically level three, but with ran, I'm sorry, level four, but with random assignment of intervention to treatment and control conditions. So you could say that areas that were randomly assigned to have CCTV surveillance, so a reduction in crime compared to control areas. And this is really the gold standard because in addition to evaluating crime before and after CCTV, using a control group and controlling for potential explanations, uh, uh, potential alternative explanations, it uses random assignment to make the two groups, meaning the treatment and the comparison group, 
uh, equivalent and thus the making the comparison valid. So following the standards, um, what uh, Larry uh, Sherman and colleagues uh, uh, suggest is that levels one and two are really an acceptable quality uh, for a rigorous research design. And levels three to five go from acceptable to the gold standard, where the gold standard being the random controlled trial, um, which we're discussing today. So RCTs uh, basically do a random assignment uh, of treatment. It makes the groups uh, equivalent, the treatment and the control group equivalent. And then we can safely assume that the changes in the outcome variable are due to the intervention and not other alternative explanations. However, randomized controlled trials are not always the best option. I would be lying to you if I were to say you should always use an RCT, right? Because there is many constraints that you could have uh, with an RCT. And depending on the research question and the type of intervention, you may want to use um, other, other methods. But if you're thinking about an RCT, you should ask yourself at least four questions. The first question is, can the variables of interest be manipulated uh, practically and ethically? Right? Um, Mike is, uh, later on, Mike is going to give you a, a, an interesting example from one of his uh, studies about uh, you know, the ethical and practical manipulation of, of an intervention. Um, so you can think of uh, whether it is uh, practical to uh, uh, apply a patrolling uh, strategy in certain areas but not others. You could also ask yourself whether it's ethical to deprive certain neighborhoods that might have you know, hot spots and, and high levels of crime from uh, of a, uh, an intervention that could potentially help them in, in reducing criminal behavior. The second question you should ask yourself is whether the experimental intervention will distort the object of the investigation. This is known as the Hawthorne effect, um, which basically uh, argues that people change behavior when they know they're being observed. Um, so you know, you, know, you, you know that when your boss is you know, a uh, uh, brain uh, uh, on your neck, um, you're going to be on task, focusing on, on your work and not checking your email or your Facebook or whatever, right? Um, you could argue the same about uh, the body-worn cameras, right? The whole idea is that by having this observation of the police officer behavior, the police officer is going to behave uh, well. So in our uh, CCTV example, we could, uh, argue, we could question ourselves whether awareness of CCTV could also change the behavior of potential victims by, by making them lower their guard and maybe uh, leading to an increase in crime, or does it increase the fear of crime and does make them more likely to avoid certain areas, right? So we have to think about how the intervention could also uh, affect the behavior of those who uh, we expect will uh, benefit from it. The next question you, you need to ask yourself is, uh, is whether the research is more concerned with causal processes or uh, with outcomes. RCTs are ideal when the focus is on outcomes, say crime reduction, right? They, but they may be less useful in identifying causal processes. So we might learn that CCTV reduces crime, but we won't know exactly how this happened. Um, is it because residents change behavior, uh, as suggested in the previous uh, example, or is it that offenders change behavior? Behavior. This, to, to answer these questions, you will need a different type of design, probably using surveys uh, or field observations. But the RCT is not really going to get at the process. It's only going to get at the effect on the outcome. And the last question you should probably ask yourself is whether cases, subjects, areas or participants can be randomly assigned. Um, this is one of those uh, questions that, you know, uh, leads to the practical considerations. Um, I just heard about a study coming out of Louisiana uh, that was looking at racial disparity in sentencing of juveniles. And Louisiana actually provided a, a, a nice uh, field experiment because juveniles are randomly assigned to judges. Um, in that jurisdiction, so it allowed the researcher to just use the, the 
the normal practice of randomly assigning uh, a defendant to a judge to identify whether there were any uh, racial disparities um, in sentencing. But there are others that are more difficult to randomize. Um, right now, there is a, a big effort uh, in implementing valid risk uh, pretrial risk assessment tools across the country. And uh, some people who are evaluating these, these approaches um, are, are attempting to get um, uh, you know, jurisdictions to randomize the assignment of the risk assessment tool, which is not always uh, something that is very easy to sell um, to practitioners. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of RCTs? So getting at the feature of random assignment, the advantage of that is that it controls the four factors that are external to the intervention. So this is the group equivalence that I was discussing before. By randomly assigning the treatment, you make the two groups equivalent, and thus your conclusions will be more, more valid. The disadvantage of random assignment is that many research topics are not susceptible to random assignment. And this is one of the issues law enforcement agencies most frequently struggle with when deciding to use RCTs. Can we truly randomly assign a policing strategy? What will be the backlash if the agency implements a strategy that is, that is expected to reduce crime in one area, but not in another area that might be in dire need? In terms of the, uh, being able to manipulate variables, the advantage is that the RCT allows you to, uh, to decide you know, what, uh, uh, what intervention is going to be present and where how long is it going to be implemented for, and with what level of, of, of intensity. But sometimes you cannot manipulate the variables, right? So either impossible or uh, ethically difficult to manipulate. So ex an example of that, say you're looking at the use of force uh, by police officers, and you want to see whether uh, you know, college education has an effect on the use of force. But you cannot control for that, right? You're going to have some uh, police officers in, 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 the, uh, in, in the agency who will be college educated and some others that will be not college educated, depending on um, you know, the uh, uh, eligibility criteria. But that's not something you can change very easily. So that, that will be difficult to, to manipulate. And again, you know, the idea of whether you should implement a policing strategy in some high crime areas but not others also raises questions. In terms of effectiveness, um, and, I, and I mentioned this before, uh, RCTs are very good at investigating uh, short-term, relatively uncomplicated interventions. However, they are less good at identifying long-term effects um, because they, those might be obscured by what's known in research methods as the history threat to validity. So in other words, um, what this means is that the more time goes by, the more likely it is that any lingering effect will be muddied up by other things that took place in the interim. So for instance, going back to the CCTV example, say CCTV is implemented in a hot spot near the downtown area of a city. There's an immediate effect in reducing crime, but five years later, that neighborhood experiences gentrification and crime continues to decline. Is this, is this continued decline a lingering effect of CCTV, or is it an additional effect of gentrification? So by using the RCT uh, design, it will be hard to tease out those uh, long-term effects. Um, another uh, feature of RCTs is the, uh, what's known kind of like the, as the artificiality uh, of treatments, uh, which hel helps in keeping the contaminated influences uh, to a minimum. Um, this applies more to lab settings where the environment is fully controlled by the researcher. Um, but in the, CJ, in the criminal justice world, uh, inter interventions are, are usually not artificial. Interventions are usually affecting real people in the real world. So um, in, in, in our field, uh, the disadvantage really is not there because we are you know, we, we are uh, uh, implementing things that do affect people in the real world. We're not working in lab settings um, uh, necessarily. In terms of validity, um, the RCT design is much better 
a, a, a internal validity a conclusion, the, a, a, a estimating the internal validity of the conclusion, meaning that no other variables except for the intervention cause the result on the outcome variable. But it's not as good at, uh, at, uh, for external validity or, or generalizability. So this means basically is that um, the uh, uh, results that will have been obtained in one place may not uh, be replicated in another place. So in other words, what works in Lowell, Massachusetts, say, uh, might not work in Tempe, Arizona. So it's an issue of uh, whether you can export the results to other uh, areas. And finally, in terms, in terms of possession, possession um, uh, RCTs provide the strongest design for identifying causal outcomes. So basically, uh, uh, isolating the effects of the intervention on, it, on an outcome and keeping it uncontaminated from other potential explanations. Um, but as I said before, it's less effective at discovering the causal process. So figuring out how it actually happened. Um, that is not a, a question that you can answer with RCT necessarily. You'll need um, another method to uh, get at that. So there are a number of methodological considerations um, that we need to have when implementing an RCT. The first issue is the issue of fidelity. And what fidelity gets at is whether the intended intervention was actually delivered and whether the delivery was according to the specifications in the design. The issue of fidelity is of particular importance in, in field experiments because, uh, where practitioners administer the intervention, which is often the case in uh, policing strategies um, as opposed to the researcher. So it is very important to have specific criteria and procedures for the program implementation um, the, the, there should be a program manual that describes the procedures, techniques, and activities in, in detail. Staff uh, should be trained carefully uh, because this is key to fidelity. And all the staff involved in the program implementation uh, should also be tested on their ability to carry out the program. So it's not just delivering training, but also making sure that those who are trained are actually capable of delivering the program as uh, intended, as designed. Um, in addition to this, uh, proper supervision is also very important in making sure fidelity uh, takes place. And qualitative observations of the practitioners administering the intervention are often helpful in determining whether fidelity was met or not. This is often what we know, uh, what we call the process evaluation uh, component uh, of, of uh, the science of evaluation. The researcher also observes the practitioner um, in, uh, as they deliver the intervention to make sure that things go according to, to script. The other methodological uh, uh, consideration is to conduct is manipulation checks, to conduct manipulation checks. So basically here the idea is to determine whether the intervention was strong enough or consistent enough to have the intended uh, effect. They're particularly useful in pilot studies to decide whether the intervention is in fact having an intended effect and whether uh, the, uh, uh, kind of like the practitioner researcher team should go ahead with a, a full-scale uh, uh, implementation. And here the main question is whether the inter in intervention was in fact a successful operationalization of the concept being studied. So for instance, going back to our CCTV example, uh, it's important that we're very uh, careful in how we uh, de uh, define that outcome, right? Crime is the outcome, but how are we defining crime? CCTV is unlikely to have any effect on uh, domestic violence offenses, for instance, which tend to happen indoors and not in the street. So it's important that we define crime as something that CCTV actually could have an effect on, um, such as muggings, robberies, you know, um, assaults or brawls that could happen in the street car theft and things like that. So it's important that we have very clear um, definition of our, of our uh, outcome variable. And finally, there is the issue of statistical power. Um, the idea here is to question whether the size of the experiments and, and control groups are large enough to estimate statistical uh, significance. This is a complicated issue when we're using geographic areas as the units of analysis. Um, because oftentimes we have constraints on how many geographic areas we can use, right? There are only so many beats 
or only so many zip codes or only so many, you know, blocks. Um, so it's important that we uh, uh, conduct power tests um, to estimate this, the, 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 cor the proper sample size that we will need to um, estimate significance, and we should do this before uh, we start the implementation of our intervention. And there's also ethical and practical considerations. So there's the issue of uh, doing random, randomized controlled trials in institutional settings. Um, institutional settings such as schools uh, or prisons provide samples of convenience that uh, a lot of researchers are very fond of. But when you conduct RCTs in these kinds of settings, um, it does raise the question about the voluntary nature of participation in the study. Um, so for instance, they, uh, say, you know, we are uh, studying um, uh, police departments uh, when the subject, the study subjects are police officers, and uh, they may feel uh, obligated to participate in the study because they, they could feel that they will get in trouble at work if they don't, if they don't participate. There's also the issue of cost. Uh, and buying. Um, RCTs are often expensive and it may be difficult to be, gain the buying from institutional leaders. For instance, the police chief might not want to deal with the ba political backlash of implementing CCTV in some hot spots but not others. Or police officers assigned to an experimental patrol strategy may not believe in the potential benefits and not actually follow the intervention. So. Natural experiments like the, the Louisiana uh, juvenile sentencing example that I was uh, mentioning before will be your best bet for low-cost um, uh, RCTs. Um, however, they're very difficult to come by because, you know, it does, imp it, it does imply that the, um, the setting that we're studying actually is using a randomized uh, uh, assignment in their, in their uh, normal uh, practices. There's a, then there is the ethical issue of withholding treatment from needy populations. So how do you justify in implementing an intervention that promises to reduce crime in some high crime neighborhoods but not others? Or how do you justify, uh, you know, using a certain kind of treatment for, you know, uh, 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 substance use offenders but not others? So this uh, little cartoon here kind of exemplifies uh, uh, those those uh, three issues, right? Is the idea um, that in you know we will assign this great new evidence-based practice to the one for grade class, but not the others, um, and then, therefore you know one group will benefit and not the others. But just do this because in the future, future generations will benefit. Um, so that's you know that's something that we gotta we definitely have to consider. And the final uh, practical consideration is uh, the contamination and spillover effects. So in terms of contamination, um, so say, you know, police officers from treatment areas uh, may have informal conversations with police officers from control areas about the new strategies that they are using, and then the police officers in the control areas may try such new strategies and thus contaminate the group equivalents because now the control group is also going to receive probably a subpar uh, uh, form of the, of the treatment, but, you know, they're, they're, they're not, um, they cannot be considered as a control group uh, anymore. And in terms of spillover effects, um, there are usually two con kinds and tend to apply when the unit, unit of analysis is uh, a place. So there is the displacement, displacement effect. Um, whereby crime could be displaced in time, place, method, and type of offense, um, or the diffusion of benefits. So if the treatment and control areas are adjacent, the control areas may be contaminated by either a displacement of crime into their neighborhoods or a diffusion of benefits from the strategy that's being used in the adjacent neighborhood um, into their, uh, into their uh, uh, area. So if the adjacent area is a control group, um, that, that could uh, become um, a, a difficult in terms of piecing out the true effect um, of, the, of the intervention. And Mike is actually going to give you some uh, examples of, of this. But first, 
why don't we stop for a minute and see if anybody has questions. Um, and as people collect their thoughts, uh, I know that Mike uh, wanted to respond to a question that was submitted earlier about how to pull off uh, RCTs at low cost. Um, so Mike, can I take it over? All right. Uh, thanks, Gypsy. I know uh, the, we had one question that had been submitted ahead of time, and it involved how you can pull off these kinds of studies at, at low cost. And I had a couple of thoughts about that I wanted to, to relay. And the, the first thing I wanted to say, and this probably won't make the academics on the, on the webinar very happy, but most of the cost with RCTs often is associated with us, with the researchers. Uh, so now I'm speaking to the practitioners in the audience. Think about uh, if, you're, if you have to do this on, you know, a, a small budget, do you necessarily need an academic to carry out the, the randomized controlled trial? Now, clearly, we can be very useful for a lot of different reasons. Um, the, the independence that, that we can provide, the expertise, the guidance. But if you really need to do this on, on, a, on a small budget, can you pull it off yourself? Uh, so that's one thing to think about to reduce the cost. The other thing an agency can do uh, if, you're, if you do decide you want to work with a research partner, is, is to look out for, for grant opportunities. So, for example, Brenda and I had been talking for uh, probably a month or two about how I could help uh, with the implementation of their body-worn camera program in Tempe. And we were going to do that all pro bono. But then I was able to secure grant funding, and we were able then to do a much more sophisticated research design. The, the other thing is that uh, an agency can capitalize on an existing researcher practitioner partnership. So maybe you're working with a researcher on something else, and you can piggyback uh, this this new randomized controlled trial onto that that existing partnership and the, and the relationship that you have. Um, but the other thing is that you know you can simply make the cold call. Most most academics, most researchers, if given the opportunity to work with an agency on a randomized controlled trial, would jump at that opportunity and, and, and try to figure out the, the cost uh, in terms of finances after the fact. Um, and, and the last thing I'll raise is that another thing an agency can do is when, obviously, one of the principles that, that Gypsy was focused on was your outcomes of interest. What is, what is it you're trying to influence? If you can use existing data that you have, existing police data, to document um, you know, the change pre-post RCT, whether it be arrests or crime data or use of force data, obviously that's going to save uh, expense as well by using you know, data that's readily available. The, let's see, uh, Zoe, I don't, have we gotten any other questions? Uh, yeah, we have a question from the chat. Uh, so someone's asking, um, why is it that randomized controlled trials are less likely to produce externally valid findings? Uh, sure. That's basically because it's difficult. I'm sorry, Mike. Do you want to take it over or? No, by all means. Hello. Go ahead, Jesse. Okay. Sorry. Um, so it's uh, it it might because it, it, it will um, it's difficult to export the uh, uh, kind of like the effects of an intervention that is localized. Um, so that's why in in in, uh, in science we do a lot of replication studies to make sure that it, the the general intervention um, does uh, apply everywhere. Um, so, but a single uh, RCT in a uh, given, um, say, you know, city um, is likely is unlikely to give you a lot of information of how what might work in another city. You need to con you know continuously replicate until enough information has been amassed about that given strategy in different locations to make sure that the findings are generalizable to uh, you know to other areas. Okay, we have uh, several more questions in the chat right now, so I'm going to jump through a couple of these. Um, I'm going to paraphrase this one a little bit, um, asking basically how do you account for uh, sort of a confounding factor either in the treatment or the control area that might um, drive your outcome variable? So, for example, um, if there's a problematic you know, business location in a treatment area and the business closes, maybe try crime may uh, dramatically decrease, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the treatment. Uh, 
Do you, do you want to take that one, Mike? Yeah, you know, that's that's a difficult one because even, you know, unless you're you're conducting your, your study in a laboratory setting, and I'll I'll give an example of that in a couple of minutes, there's really there's no way you can you can have complete control of what's gonna happen. Uh, the best I think you can do is you can you can try to control for things post hoc. Uh, you know the beauty of the randomized controlled trial is that when you finally do get your data, you know, you don't have to do all these sophisticated analyses because you've assumed group equivalence and, and you've assumed that the only difference between your two groups is one got the treatment and one didn't. But in reality, there may be other things that, that affect the relationships that you're trying to study. And there's some statistical things post hoc you can do to try, try to control for that. I don't want to get too, uh, uh, too nerdy in terms of the, uh, the stats discussion, but there are some things that you can apply after the fact to try to control for that. And at the very least, you know, when you're writing up your results, you can you, you acknowledge, hey, this happened, there was nothing we could do about it, and this may have had some impact on, on the findings that we're presenting. Great, thanks. I think I'm going to do one more from chat, and then um, I'll save a couple maybe for the end of the webinar. Um, so this is a question about um, how to develop a research partnership, um, particularly in the absence of grant funding, what sort of enticement might be um, worthwhile for a researcher to bring them on board with a police department um, if there isn't, you know, a funded opportunity in play? And is, you know, what to what degree does publication opportunities play a role in that? Yeah, I can respond to that. I think there are a couple of things to think about. Um, most public universities, state universities have a service requirement. So um, pro bono work with a local agency can, can fall into to that area of responsibility for our job. Um, there is the, you know, especially if someone's on a tenure track, there is the, uh, the you know, the, the enticement of doing a, you know, participating in a rigorous research study that will then lead to a publication in a, in a top tier journal. Uh, but the other thing is, um, you know, if you work at a university where publishing is not, not a top priority, you can think about your students. Are there, um, if, if you offer some, some pro bono time for the randomized controlled trial with an agency, is that a way to open the door for some of your undergraduate or graduate students to also begin working with an agency and, and uh, whether it be through internships or, or uh, you know, independent studies or even master and uh, thesis and dissertation. So there are a couple of different things that you can think about to try to, uh, to entice that researcher to come on board with you. And, and if I may add, uh, another thing that's trending is uh, developing internal research capacity within agencies. Of course, you know, this comes at a cost, um, but if you, can, if you can actually create a research team within your organization, um, that will help you, you know, in terms of not having to outsource the research component of your, of your uh, program. All right, I'm going to suggest that we uh, move on, but I've made a note of the other questions that were asked, and if we, uh, we'll either get to them at the end of the webinar or um, we may produce a document afterwards to address these. Okay, one, uh, I did want to take a moment and talk about one example from, from my own personal experience that illustrates uh, pretty clearly some of the ethical and, and practical considerations that, that Gypsy was talking about. I recently carried out a study that examined the effects of taser exposure on cognitive functioning. So basically, when someone gets tased, how does it affect their, their memory, their ability to concentrate? How does it affect, uh, in particular, uh, the ability for them to hear their Miranda rights, understand their rights, and impossibly uh, to waive those rights in a constitutional manner? And this was a randomized controlled trial. It was carried out with uh, ASU undergraduate students. They were randomly assigned to uh, one of four groups, and, and two of those groups did, in fact, receive a taser exposure. So I had that unique experience of, of tasing a bunch of, uh, of ASU undergrads. So let's think about some of the ethical considerations there. Well, certainly one of the, the foundational principles of, uh, of social research is that you do no harm. And I know that there was some discussion among uh, my peers in the field about whether, in fact, I was violating that principle because I was uh, subjecting some students to what is a, a very painful experience. Another ethical consideration, I, I ended up paying each student who participated $200 cash. 
And there was a discussion with the IRB, the human subjects folks at the university and NIJ, about whether that was overly coercive. Is that too much money so that you're kind of violating a, a person's ability to, to, to think rationally about when they, whether they want to participate or not? And the third uh, ethical example I'll give is we recruited heavily on all the ASU campuses uh, to try to get people to participate. And I remember one night we got an email from a, from a parent. Uh, we had approached uh, this dad's uh, daughter and had given information about the study. She was very excited. She wanted to participate, and she told her parents about it. So then dad sends us an email uh, directly forbidding us from allowing his daughter to participate in the study. Uh, so clearly some ethical things to think about. Practically, uh, with regard to this study, uh, because of the risks with human subjects and, and taser exposure, any person in this study had to be 100% healthy. So they had to pass a very rigorous screening uh, protocol. But what that did is it resulted in a lot of attrition, a lot of people dropping out of the study because they, uh, they were on medication that wasn't permitted or they had a history of drug use. You know, so, for example, the day people were getting tased, uh, the first thing we did when they showed up is we gave them a breathalyzer and uh, we had them pee in a cup so they could be tested for drugs. And we lost people because they, they dropped the dirty urine. We had one participant who showed up intoxicated. Uh, so very practical considerations there. And, and also, you know, we carried out this study in a hospital, which uh, is, is a very controlled setting and is very different from what it's like when police uh, tase people in the field. So that, that's just one example that can illustrate, I think, pretty well some of the things that Gypsy was, uh, was talking about. But let's get into uh, some real-world examples uh, in policing with randomized controlled trials. And I, I just want to come back and, and refresh our memories about the principles that Gypsy had highlighted earlier. And we're going to use these, these principles to, to walk through a, a few randomized controlled trials. Obviously, the first thing uh, we have to think about is what can be randomized. And in terms of policing research and policing RT RCTs, most commonly that involves people and places. So RCTs and policing typically randomize police officers or, or perhaps offenders, where they randomize uh, places, whether they be hot spots or, uh, or beats or precincts or something like that. The, of course, the key with uh, the randomization is that you're um, you're taking whether you're you're working with people or places. Uh, you're taking half of those, and uh, they're going to get treatment, and half of those are not. And you know how they wind up in a group, whether it's people or places, that is that random process. But then the second principle is what is that treatment or intervention? And you know, in policing, that could be you know anything that that you're interested in testing. Um, you know, some some recent fairly common examples. Um, Gypsy mentioned body-worn cameras. There was an important study looking at, at DNA and property crime investigation. You can look at different policing strategies. You can look at different types and levels of patrol. There was an important study by the Police Foundation looking at shift length. So all sorts of things can be, can be the treatment or the intervention uh, that, that is under study. And then last, uh, importantly, is what is that outcome of interest that you're looking at? And, and for the researchers, in our language, that's the, the dependent variable. So what is the, what is the outcome you want to affect, whether it be arrests or, or clearance rates, use of force, whatever, whatever it might be. So let's, let's talk about uh, three particular examples in, in policing. And I want to talk about one classic study and then and two that are a little more contemporary. So let's talk about a classic one, which is the Minneapolis domestic violence experiment. And that was carried out in the, in the early 1980s. Let's go through our three principles to, uh, to examine this particular RCT. So what was randomized? What was randomized in this study is domestic violence calls, specifically domestic violence calls where there was a probable cause to make an arrest. What was the treatment? The treatment was how the officer resolved the encounter. And there were three different options. Uh, officers could either arrest, they could separate the parties, or they could engage in some mediation or, or counseling. And keep in mind, it was randomized. So how they did this in this study is officers carried around a color-coded pad with, with one color assigned to each of the three uh, case outcomes that they could use. And an officer would roll up on a scene. Once it was determined that the, you know, the 
the incident met the criteria for the study, the officer pulled out the color-coded pad and saw the color on top and then determined what the officer was supposed to do to resolve that incident. The outcome of interest, the third principle. In this study, they were particularly interested in the recidivism of offenders, specifically uh, future domestic violence. And the, the question uh, of concern was whether or not those who were arrested or whether arrests decreased the likelihood of uh, subsequent domestic violence offenses compared to those, uh, those other alternatives for resolving the encounters. And as most of us know, the, uh, the study determined that uh, def uh, uh, domestic violence offenders who were arrested were much less likely to, to subsequently reoffend. And at the time, this was a really important study because there was a, uh, a, a fairly strong movement to uh, shift toward mandatory arrests for domestic violence, specifically in felony cases. And, and this study provided some important evidence uh, for that movement. And, and of course, most of us know that in the 90s there were additional replications of this study that, uh, that did uh, provide some additional insights about the impact of arrests. And I should say, because of the, uh, the time constraints, my discussions will be relatively uh, superficial. So let's talk about an example that uh, is a little more contemporary, the Philadelphia Smart Policing Initiative. This was carried out in, in 2010 and 2011. And in this study, uh, the, the researchers from Temple University and Philly PD decided to randomize violent crime hotspots. Uh, second principle, what was the treatment? The treatment was what the officers did in those hotspots. And they had three different types of officer activity. They had problem-oriented policing, they had targeted offender strategy, and they had foot patrol. And the way they designed this was um, essentially each strategy was given 27 hotspots, uh, 20 of which would get the treatment and seven that served as control. So for example, there were 20 hotspots that got problem-oriented policing and, and seven that, that served as control. Another 20 got targeted offenders and so forth. And the outcome of interest uh, was crime. And specifically, they were looking at which of those three types of officer activities uh, gave the most bang for buck in terms of crime reduction in uh, identified violent crime hotspots. And uh, you can go onto the SPI website if you want to, to get this uh, spotlight report or look at uh, Jerry Ratcliffe's uh, uh, papers that he's published. But essentially, they found that uh, the targeted offenders strategies outperformed the other two strategies in terms of crime reduction. And if you, if you delve into this, they have lots of insights about why they think that might have happened. The other example that I want to talk about um, involves a, a contemporary issue, uh, is, and that's body-worn cameras. And I'm conducting two studies right now, two randomized controlled trials, one with, with uh, Brenda and Tempe and another in Spokane. So what did we randomize? We randomized police officers. So essentially, we got a list of all patrol officers uh, in each department, and, and we randomized those into two groups, a treatment group and a control group. The treatment, of course, was body-worn cameras. Those in the treatment group were given body-worn cameras, and those in the control group uh, were, were not given body-worn cameras. And this happened for a period of, of six months, where you had half of the patrol officers with cameras and, and half without. The outcome of interest. Um, you know, we're looking at some of the big ticket items that other body-worn camera studies have looked at, use of force complaints, um, and, and obviously we're looking at whether or not body-worn cameras lead to significant changes, uh, specifically reductions in those levels. And we're also looking at citizen attitudes as well. I can tell you, I can't tell you much about the findings because as we speak, I have, uh, I have uh, team members looking at the, the use of force and, and complaint outcomes. Uh, but it, as I said, if you're following this at all, you know that a number of studies have documented fairly significant declines in force and in complaints. Uh, Rialto, for example, Phoenix, Mesa, Orlando, Oakland. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, just recently a couple of studies have, have come out which have, uh, have produced some inconsistent findings with regard to these, to these outcomes. And I will say, uh, in both places we're looking at, as I said, uh, citizen attitudes and, and we're a little further along in Spokane, and what we found among citizens is that uh, with regard to procedural justice, when citizens know that a camera is present, they rate their encounter as more procedurally just compared to those who are unaware of the camera. So um, 
that's just one more example of uh, a randomized controlled trial in the field. Now, uh, just a, a bit of a recap before uh, turning it over to Brenda for the practitioner's perspective. Uh, and, and these hit on some points that Gypsy has, has highlighted as well, is the randomization practical and ethical. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is in a randomized controlled trial, people are being deprived of the intervention for the sake of science. So in the Minneapolis study, there were domestic violence offenders who could have been arrested but were not. In, uh, in my studies, there were officers who could have gotten body-worn cameras but did not. And I had conversations with probably five or six Tempe police officers who wanted to know why they had to wait six months to get their body-worn camera. The contamination issue, uh, this is basically when your control conditions are exposed to the treatment. You know, a good example I'm wrestling with uh, in the body-worn camera study is that I have a number of calls where a treatment officer and a control officer have both responded to the same call. So that represents some degree of contamination. And then the implementation issue, are the protocols being followed? This is, uh, Gypsy used the term fidelity. We know this was an issue in the Minneapolis domestic violence study. We know there were a number of times where an officer would roll up on a scene, pull out that color-coded uh, pad, and see what action they were supposed to take, and then decide not to do that. Uh, they weren't supposed to make an arrest. They were supposed to mediate, but they decided to make an arrest. So these are some of the challenges that we have to deal with. Uh, I think at this point, uh, it's, it's a good time to, to turn to Brenda, and she can give us the practitioner's perspective on RCTs. Well, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Um, well, good afternoon. This is Brenda Buren. As Mike said, I'm from the Tempe, Arizona Police Department, and uh, I'm happy to be here on this session. And I also just want to take a moment to thank all of you who are participating on the webinar that work in the criminal justice field. I saw the list of registrants, and it was pretty impressive um, with the numbers and types of organizations that you all represent. And as a law enforcement practitioner, I can tell you that we need your contributions more than ever right now. So thanks again for the work that each of you do in this field. Um, Mike and Gypsy did a, a great job walking us through the experimental design process and the use of randomized control trials in real-world settings. And I simply want to provide a, a practitioner's perspective on why I think this type of rigorous re research is so important uh, in, in our everyday lives as a, as a practitioner, and also outline some of the considerations for anyone who wants to conduct research in a real-world environment, uh, specifically uh, research that requires the involvement of you know, the criminal justice system or an organization. So I'm a big fan of rigorous research and uh, for two primary reasons. And first and foremost, I think that uh, these good research designs produce good research findings. And solid research findings can dramatically improve organizational decision making. And Tempe is currently involved in two major research projects with university partners that exemplify, I think, how good research is and will continue to help us make strategic decisions in the organization in which I work. And uh, the first one is the body worn camera study that Mike has referenced. And although we don't have the final results yet of the, the randomized um, control trial, we do have some great interim information that Mike and his team have helped us out with. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, we have some interim survey results comparing officer perceptions of those um, who had worn the body-worn camera and those that did not. And it really let us know what we were doing well in the planning and implementation process and then those things that we needed to improve upon. And uh, we know that the final results will no doubt guide us in making changes to our program um, that will make it better and achieve results internally and externally that make our officers and community safer. So um, as, as Mike noted in his introduction, officers and other police personnel are actively involved in this research. Um, when that uh, uh, Cambridge study came out, um, we, had our, we have committee meetings that we have every month with our team, and Mike and his group are there. And we actually had one of our officers questioning the research design of the Cambridge study, which you know is great for those of us involved in research to hear. Um, a second example uh, is a study that we have going on right now with a business professor, actually, from Arizona State University. And uh, although different than the kind of research we're talking about here today, um, he is doing some very rigorous um, uh, survey research in our department on discretion and employee engagement and internal legitimacy, which is a huge topic out there right now. And uh, what we're learning from his study is that um, our leadership and management focus as an executive team in our department 
has been on employee engagement, when in reality we should probably be focusing our efforts on our efforts on internal legitimacy and fairness. So um, very different types of studies that we're involved in, um, but very helpful for us as an organization to understand what's going on with our department in Tempe. Now, the second reason I'm a big fan of uh, rigorous research design is that it contributes to the literature in the, in the criminal justice field more broadly. And this probably sounds a little bit corny coming from a practitioner, but I can tell you it's very important to us. Um, we use this kind of information every day in making decisions, and we also know that the academic community um, you know, can build upon this type of information. And so when we set out on our body-worn camera study, we actually thought about the fact that where we are and where we're starting from, we're a very data-rich environment for, for a researcher, and that's one of the things that we thought about um, when we went out looking for a research partner. And I have to say that uh, you know we're, we're very focused on evidence-based policing in Tempe, and you know historically we would go out and ask the question, you know, what are other departments doing? And now we are much more likely to ask, you know, uh, what does the research say? And uh, so at the end of the day, the research is important to us because we want to know what works and what doesn't. I think that was. Um, brought out very early on in the introduction of this webinar is that that's why we're all here, is to find out what works and what doesn't. And that's not any different uh, for us who are in the practitioner world. Um, the second thing I wanted to hit on a little bit, and, and, and Mike and Gypsy have covered quite a bit of this um, in, the, uh, the, in their presentation, but I wanted to discuss briefly um, some considerations that you all as researchers may want to think about um, when pursuing rigorous research in a criminal justice environment. And uh, I think the first and foremost one for us uh, working in a, in a police department is that the research really needs to be practical, you know, at least from the perspective of the organization. And uh, a researcher needs to consider the value that it has to the organization and to other organizations. Um, you know, an example of the body-worn camera research, it's very important to us in Tempe because we're actually implementing it, so we wanted to participate. Um, on top of that, and this is a you know, a topic out in the field, you know, as a result of the 21st century policing project and the new technology that's out there um, is very important to people. And so I think it's very important that you know that uh, it, it has to be practical. Um, <clears throat> I think another thing uh, that's really important that I don't think really anybody hit on today, and, and that is, is if there's a way for you to find an advocate in the organization in which you want to work, that can be extremely helpful. Um, if you find at least one person, whether it's the police chief or whether it's a crime analyst or, or anybody in the organization who can help you develop a relationship um, in that organization, I, I think that's really critical. They can pave the way for you in many ways in terms of getting your research done. Um, I think one thing that's been talked about quite a bit is, um, is the treatment and the, you know, whether or not we're doing harm by not uh, implementing that treatment. And uh, I would have to add to that is recognizing the, the time horizon that practitioners have. You know, oftentimes they want they don't want to wait very long you know, to implement something, the treatment um, that they think is a really good program. And so you have to be aware of that. On the flip side, I would also note that uh, I think a researcher can oftentimes work pretty effectively with an organization uh, because the, the time frames that are out there might be short, but there's also logistics that are involved. Um, you know, for instance, in our body-worn camera study, uh, although we had some officers that definitely wanted the camera, uh, we had some logistic realities. Um, we did not have the, uh, the number of people in our technology arena, um, nor the people in our purchasing arena and all of that to get all 360 of our officers a camera on day one. So we broke it up into three phases. And uh, that just was helpful with the research. And so I think a lot of times um, you can work on those time horizons with folks. Um, you know, most officers want to implement everything immediately, but the reality is if you're doing it well and you're planning for it, um, you can't do everything at day one. And uh, I think working with your organization on those logistical timelines can really help people get in and do more of this um, randomized control trial type of research. Another topic that I uh, got touched upon was the researchers themselves. Um, from my perspective, um, I think you need very skilled researchers to do this type of work. Um, I think it, it helps with the credibility of uh, allowing the research to be done in the first place. And then obviously, you know, the, the results of the study, I think, are taken to heart a bit more if you have really skilled researchers. Um, I think they have to have strong credentials um, and experience, and it helps that they've done some applied research. 
And as Mike, as Mike noted, the, I think that they can certainly be external, um, which we prefer sometimes, or they can be internal. Uh, in Tempe, we have a pretty strong research and analytical arm in our department. We have about 500 employees, 360 officers, and we have seven analysts uh, in our department. And they do a variety of different things. And so we have them you know, do some small studies, um, even random assignment types of studies. Um, but when it comes to something big, like the body one camera study, we wanted somebody external for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it's a big time constraint. Uh, this is a big study. If you're doing it right, it's going to take a lot of time and energy. And our analysts just did not have the time to do that. Um, the second is, I think what Mike hit on too, is the independence. We really want to make sure that um, we don't get sort of criticized for doing our own research on this big topic. And so it was important for us to, to go externally. Um, so it's really about the complexity, time, and desire for independence, um, whether or not we use internal or external researchers. Another big item is the cost. Uh, I think Jesse hit on this quite a bit. Um, it's often difficult for you know organizations to pay for this type of research, um, but I think uh, Mike also hit on the question that was asked about how can you do this in somewhat expensive ways, and uh, I, I think there's certainly ways to get around it. Um, but uh, it, it is difficult for organizations to come up with money to do this. And to be honest, it often isn't at the highest part of our priority list when we're out making budget. Um, you know, doing a research design on something that may cost a half million dollars is probably not going to make it to the top of the list. And so it's great that there's other alternatives out there, particularly the grant funding is out there um, that allows really good research to be done. One other thing I wanted to hit on quickly was the trust. Um, inside of an organization. And it's that, you know, building that trust initially and on an ongoing basis. Because I think once you have developed that trust as a researcher, if you choose to do more research in that organization later on, it's a lot easier. I can assure you if Mike White wants to come into Tempe um, in two or three years and study something entirely different, um, the fact that we have had a good relationship and that uh, uh, he has been very open and honest and transparent in his research, he will be welcomed back into the department. So I think that's something to consider as well, as you can build these long-term relationships with organizations if you so choose. Um, it, further, in terms of that trust, I think it's the day-to-day -day piece of it. Um, depending on how close you want to get to officers or get to employees in the organization, um, you may want to do some things like we did. And uh, we asked Mike and his research team if they mind to go into a background um, exam to, to give them full access to our department. We certainly didn't require it, and they certainly would have been welcome. Um, but we knew that if they were comfortable with that, we could give them an ID card, and they can come and go as they please, and they can have uh, whatever access to the officers or any other employees they wanted. And uh, a couple of them chose to do that, and I think that that has served them well um, as well. So that really helped build some trust in our organization. I think um, also working with the, the leadership in the organization is very helpful. Um, it, it allows you know the organization to know that the, one the research is important and allows the employees to know that it's okay to participate and that we encourage them to participate if they would like to participate. Um, and it also helps when issues come up. You know, every once in a while something will come up where you know rumor starts or that sort of thing. It's easy to. to uh, provide accurate information and make sure that, that that type of thing doesn't continue in the organization. I would also add uh, the need to be uh, flexible when working with the organization is very important. Um, you know, when we were rolling out the cameras, as Mike said, we had uh, some officers that, you know, why am I why am I not getting a camera? Or a union president came in and said, hey, so and so really needs a camera, um, and we were able to sit down and work with them and tell them, you know, why we were doing this. Um, and that, you know, work through that process a little bit better. So um, also, Mike is very flexible in terms of schedules, in terms of making sure that all those, those issues were addressed. So the flexibility is really important. And I think I'll just sort of end on one other thing that was touched upon early on that um, it does impact us pretty dramatically with uh, research in the organization, and those are the political realities. Um, you know, some topics become a bit of concern for practitioners. You know, based on what's going on out there in society, what's getting attention in the media, and that sort of thing. And I'll say in terms of what helps with that, if you want to sort of mitigate those issues as you're working with an organization, I would say one is if you can sort of get in early, um, get in early before people start reacting to whatever those issues are. And again, the body worn camera example is one where um, we started that early. We started it before 
we had some sort of controversy in Tempe that required us to implement those cameras quickly. And it also helped us to bring the researchers in at the very beginning. And uh, so I would say get in early. I would reiterate the building trust um, is very important. And uh, the third part of that is you know, ensuring those who need to know know about the research. And we talked about that internally within the organization. But for us in Tempe, that goes further um, to make sure that people outside of the police department um, are aware of what's going on. Uh, that can be our city manager. That can be our city council. That can be the media. Um, so when negative things pop up, um, we're able to address those. It also goes out to communicating with our uh, interagency partners, so to speak. Um, an example of that is we spent a lot of time with our prosecutors and our municipal judge before we ever implemented the camera because we know that down the criminal justice stream that those cameras were going to affect them. And so we made sure that we spent a lot of time and energy on that. Um, we spent a lot of time and energy on the technology uh, because we did not want that to skew the research um, in the sense that we know if we had bad technology to start with, the officers are going to hate using it. Um, and that's going to you know, change the entire outcome of our project and the research. So um, those are just some things that, uh, from a practitioner's perspective, uh, I would say that everybody needs to consider when doing this type of research. And uh, you know, on, on that note, I'll just wrap this uh, component up and say that I personally think that rigorous research in the real world is critically important, and that if you can get an advocate and work with an organization effectively, you know, by recognizing their needs, you can conduct great research that, that really benefits us all. So, um, with that, I'm finished. Okay, thanks, Brenda. I, I guess what happens when you have three people with PhDs talk, we, it's inevitable that we'll run over on, on the time. Uh, so I, I guess I'll kick it back to, to Vivian and Zoe. I'm not sure if we have any more time for questions or if we're going to have to end now and we can respond to questions uh, after the fact. Um, I think we can take one or two. So I mean, if anyone has any, they should feel free to submit them in the chat. Um, and then um, there's a couple still lined up from last time. So. Um, I think we will end up probably addressing some of these offline after the recording is over, but um, here's one to throw out to the group, and I think this sort of could be for any of you, um, is um, discussing the, um, you know, the issue of um, assigning, and Brenda was just discussing this, uh, how, it, how you get buy-in from officers when you are going to do a randomized controlled design in order to um, in order to make sure that people buy into the idea that some people may get cameras and some people may not, or whatever the treatment might be. And this person is asking, do you think that there's a part of that is driven by a lack of understanding of the research design principles and why randomization is important? Well, I can, I can, I can, I can add one quick point to that, and then may, I, I'd like to hear Brenda's perspective. The one thing I'll say that, that has benefited me both in Tempe and Spokane and in the past is is the capacity issue. And temp, in Tempe, Brenda referred to this. They couldn't possibly roll out all the cameras all at once. So really, we, we piggybacked on that idea of limited capacity, and, and we simply applied the randomization to the fact that there were limitations in terms of what could be done on day one. So Brenda, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of our big selling points uh, with it was the fact that logistically we couldn't do it in any other way, so why not take advantage of this to get some research done? Um, I think the other thing is we had an unusual scenario with body-worn cameras where we did want officers, well, we had officers wanting the cameras, so that's a little bit different. But I think at the core of, of the question that was asked was, uh, I think, yes. Um, I think a lot of people do not understand the benefits of the random assignment to the research. Uh, I think they are getting a sense of research broadly and why it's important, um, but the importance of random assignment in particular. And so we spent a lot of time in our committee meeting talking about the research, why it was important. Um, and our committee included uh, uh, a lot of officers and, and other folks throughout the department. And their job was to go out and talk to people about not only the project itself, but the research. And so as a result, we really got a lot of buy-in to that. So I think it's important in terms of understanding the importance of the project and why we're pursuing it in a certain way. And then very much related to that is that you're going to do that research is why is the research important? And then secondarily, why is the random assignment so important? Um, you know, I was mentioning that we had an officer, you know, in our committee 
questioning the, uh, the uh, research design of another study, I think that just goes to show you that they're understanding that, that you can't just go after the fact and look and see what happens. You have to study it through the process. And by, in this scenario, somebody having a camera and somebody not, um, that's a pretty good comparative um, assessment. So I do think that um, sharing um, the, the purpose of the research and the understanding why random assignment is so important is very valuable in getting buy-in in the organization. Great. So we're really coming up on the end of our hour and a half here. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Vivian to close out the webinar. Wonderful. Thank you, Zoe, and to all of our speakers um, and for all of you participating. Um, we really hope that you enjoyed the webinar today. And of course, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to send them to us um, at our email address. It's spi at cna.org. Uh, we'll also work on uh, compiling any additional questions into uh, a response document and post that on our website for those um, who are interested in learning more. Um, so just thank you all for your time and to our speakers. Uh, and Kate, is there any last uh, words that you'd like to share? Um, only a big thank you to CNA for putting on a great webinar and our presenters and uh, for everybody who spent their afternoon with us to learn about this important topic. Appreciate it and thank you. Great. Thanks, Kate. And thanks, everyone.